We'll get started shortly. Good evening all, we're waiting for people to join, so please be patient. We'll get started momentarily. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming inside on such a beautiful day in Northeast Ohio. Matthew, I should tell you, it was close to 70 degrees in February today. Sounds lovely. It's a little, it's a little warmer where I am, but uh, that would, that, that sounds like a very good winter temperature. For February, it's amazing. Um, while you're all getting situated and more people are joining, I'll take a moment and remind you all, most of you know, my name is Gwendolyn Mayer and I am the archivist here at the Hudson Library and Historical Society. This is another one of our author programs. Um, we're waiting for people to join and we'll get started momentarily. While people are coming in, I'll very briefly mention our upcoming programs. Tomorrow night, Adam Brooks is speaking on his book, Fragile Cargo. It's about Chinese artifacts and museums um, and an interesting story. On Saturday at 1 p.m., we have the Darkness Manifesto by John Eckloff. I think I'm butchering his name. He talks about the loss of darkness in our world and how it's impacting us. And on Monday, we're absolutely excited to have our author in person. It is author James Rollins, and he will be speaking at 630 on his book, um, The Hidden Ice, or the I believe it's The Hidden Ice. So please take a moment, go to the registrations, which you're all familiar with, the registration page at the thehudsonlibrary.org, and register for some upcoming authors if you so like. Um, Tonight, we have the wonderful um, honor of hosting Matthew Campbell. He is a journalist at Business, help me, with Business, I saw it once and I've already uh, Bloom, Bloom, you just say it, Bloomberg. I, I work for Bloomberg. Bloomberg, thank you. And he has written his first book called Dead in the Water, a true story of hijacking, murder, and a global maritime conspiracy. Before we get too much further, I want to tell you that he is a an award-winning reporter. He covers major political and business stories in the Asian and Pacific region. He's joining us this evening from Singapore, everybody. So, you know, he really does know his region. He has reported from more than 25 countries on subjects including crime, terrorism, climate change. And he just told me tonight, he's got another new book coming out in the near future. I don't know the title. We won't bug him about it yet. But tonight he's gonna talk to us about um, the true story of hijacking and murder and the Brillante Virtuoso. Boy, my mouth doesn't work tonight. Welcome, Matthew, and good evening. Thank you very much. So um, I will give you the, the, the high-level summary of, of this book, what, what it is and, and how it came about. Uh, and, and then we can go to the audience for questions, which are always more interesting than me talking. Um, so, so the book is a story about, uh, fundamentally, and, and this, this is a lot less boring than it sounds, I promise, uh, the insurance industry. Uh, and, and I'll tell you why and, and why that is in fact so interesting when you would think it would be the most boring thing in the world. Um, it departs from an event that occurred in 2011, which was a pirate attack or, or an apparent pirate attack. And, and the apparent part will become important later on on an oil tanker uh, called the Brillante Virtuoso. Uh, not, believe it or not, a, a very, an especially large oil tanker. It was only uh, 274 meters, so about 300 yards uh, bow to stern, which believe it or not, makes it only a regularly large oil tanker, not, not a true super tanker. It's carrying $100 million of oil to China uh, from uh, Ukraine transits the Suez Canal, goes through a body of water called the Gulf of Aden, uh, which is essentially between Somalia and Yemen. Uh, every vessel traveling from Europe to Asia has to travel that water. Uh, it is attacked by pirates. This uh, in itself was not unusual at the time. Uh, if you think back 10 or 12 years, uh, this was really the, the golden age of Somali piracy. So uh, Captain Phillips, which is a very good, very accurate film, uh, depicted events that took place in 2009, I believe, 
And 2009, 2010, 2011, there were pirate attacks in that region just about every day, in fact, and, and many of them successful. So the vessel is attacked uh, in the course of its hijacking by a gang of pirates. Uh, there is uh, an explosion and a fire. The fire is catastrophic. It essentially destroys the vessel. Uh, the crew uh, amazingly are able to escape. They are rescued by the U.S. Navy. And the pirates disappear. Uh, no one knows where they've gone. So what you have at this point is a 300-yard-long oil tanker, which is itself worth 70 or $80 million, uh, carrying $100 million worth of oil, floating, burning uh, in the middle of a major shipping lane. So that's a lot of things. You know, it's obviously a humanitarian issue uh, if the crew were in danger. In this case, thankfully, they weren't. Uh, it is an environmental problem, you know, a ship full of oil on fire. Uh, but it is also, from a business perspective, uh, fundamentally a liability. Uh, you have this huge asset, a ship and its cargo, which have, of course, gotten insurance. Uh, and that asset is in the process of being destroyed. And that's a problem at one place in particular, uh, which is called Lloyd's of London, uh, which a lot of people know uh, sort of vaguely has something to do with insurance, uh, it, which it certainly does. It is not itself an insurer, uh, and we can talk about that later. But Lloyd's is where ships and ship voyages and ship cargoes are insured. And when there is a, an accident, a disaster, in this case, a pirate attack that, that destroys a vessel, uh, what Lloyd's needs to do is get someone on the ground to take a look. So this is just as if uh, you know a tree falls on your garage and the claims adjuster comes from the insurance company to take a look before they pay out. The exact same thing happens with maritime accidents or maritime casualties, as they're called, just obviously on a much, much larger scale. So in this case, uh, the person who was sent was a British guy named David Mockett who uh, was what's called a marine surveyor, someone who investigates maritime accidents. He uh, lived at the time in Yemen. Uh, he'd lived there uh, much of his career. He was in his 60s, had really spent most of his adult life in the Middle East, uh, though his, his wife and kids lived in England and Devon. So if there was an accident requiring someone to take a look on behalf of Lloyd's in this part of the world, David was the guy. And he was hired. He goes out to the vessel, uh, which has been taken over by salvage crews. The fires have been extinguished. It's still floating, but it's a wreck. It's, it's a total loss, financially speaking. Looks around, talks to some of the crew, does his usual uh, quote unquote survey, meaning he, he tries to ascertain what's happened and, and why it might have happened. And uh, he has some doubts. He begins to really wonder if the story of this pirate attack, this explosion, makes sense, if perhaps something else happened, if there could be more to the story. Uh, and he shares those doubts, both with people locally uh, in Aden, the city in Yemen where he lived, and also with uh, the many people who by this point were involved with uh, the case of this tanker, which is, uh, as, as Quinn said, the Berlante Virtuoso was its name. Um, because when something like this happens, dozens of people are involved uh, because it is such a large financial issue. He circulates his findings, his doubts. He shares with others that he has suspicions about what had really occurred that night in the Gulf of Aden. And uh, he's continuing to work. Uh, things are in Yemen are becoming more difficult. He is, uh, if, if you remember early, early 2011, uh, the Arab Spring had really spread across the region. Yemen was a little late, uh, but by the time we pick up the story in the summer of 2011, things are really exploding in Yemen. Um, nonetheless, David continues to work, continues doing his job, refuses to leave. And as he's sending around these findings, continuing to investigate on uh, July 20th, 2011, uh, he got into his car uh, outside his office in the center of Aden to drive home, uh, turned the key, pulled out of the driveway and onto a busy road. And uh, within less than a minute, uh, a bomb that had been placed under the driver's seat of the car detonated, uh, killing him uh, and, and clearly intended to kill only him. The uh, authorities in Yemen and the UK at the time 
uh, blamed terrorism, you know, civil unrest, tough part of the world. Uh, that was the obvious explanation. But uh, as my co-author Kit Chalel and I found out through investigating the story, which we did over uh, about a five-year period, um, that was not what happened. And in fact, the real story of the Berlante Virtuoso of David Mockett's murder uh, was much darker and, and much stranger. And uh, so the book essentially is about, the first half is about these two crimes, uh, this pirate attack and what it really represented uh, and David Mockett's murder. And the second half is about the unraveling of these crimes by some very brave people, uh, including two private detectives, uh, Richard Veal and Michael Connor, uh, who ended up getting the case and, and becoming kind of obsessed with it. It took over their lives. So that, that's the kind of general sketch of the book. Um, you know, what I, what I found fascinating about it, uh, among the things I found fascinating about it, was as a shipping novice learning about that world. I know nothing about ships, shipping, maritime issues. Um, you know, I quickly understood uh, that this is an industry that is basically completely essential to every aspect of modern life. There's a great book called 90% of Everything. Uh, and it's sort of a, a grand tour of the shipping industry. And the reason it's called 90% of Everything is because it's more or less true that 90% of all the goods you use come to you on ships. Uh, that's true of consumer goods. It's true of furniture. It's true of a lot of food. Uh, oil, obviously, is a big one. So without low cost shipping, the entire global economy would grind to a halt. There would be nothing on the shelves at Walmart. Uh, there would be very little gasoline uh, in service stations and so on. Um, but it's an industry that most of us know very little about. I think, uh, you know, everyone can name an oil company. I, I really would challenge many people in the audience tonight to name a single shipping company. Uh, everyone knows people who work in lots of other industries. I would take a pretty strong bet that there's no one on this call and no one in the families of anyone on this call who works on a commercial vessel. Although I could be wrong, you know, in, in, in the US, there's a slight exception to this, which we can talk about. Um, and this is because the shipping industry operates totally anonymously, largely in the shadows, completely offshore, uh, offshore in every sense, by the way, obviously the ships are offshore, so is all the money. Uh, so are all the legal structures that sustain it, all incorporated in secrecy jurisdictions like the Cayman Islands, the Bahamas, Bermuda. Um, and it's really almost completely unregulated. Uh, there is no international body that is capable of enforcing laws on shipping in the way they are enforced, for example, on uh, air travel and, and air transportation. Um, in many cases, and this totally blew my mind when I found it out. Uh, ships are owned anonymously. So even the US government, when a 300 yard or 400 yard long oil tanker comes into the port of New Orleans, uh, even the United States government may have no idea who owns it. They will know who the brass plate is uh, in the Cayman Islands or, or some other secrecy jurisdiction that officially owns it. But who is actually behind that, the so-called ultimate beneficial owner or UBO, uh, may be and often is completely unknown. And that's also true of the people doing business with that ship. They don't actually know who they're dealing with. They know who, uh, they only know what the brass plate is and the brass plate company might have some lawyers or bankers who they deal with directly. So as you can imagine, and, and as this book shows, uh, that kind of environment creates unbelievable opportunities for mischief and malfeasance and, and even murder. Uh, as, uh, as we found out. So with that, you know, I don't want to give away too much of the plot, but I'm happy to, to elaborate uh, on, on other aspects of it. Uh, I think I'm happy to, to throw it to Gwen and, and to the audience. Thank you. It, it's a fascinating topic. But I'd like to start, start with David Mockett um, in Yemen, who is the British citizen, as I understand, who essentially is like an insurance investigator, but for maritime issues, right? That's correct. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Can you tell us what kind of qualifications he had to do that? He had a really interesting background. Uh, he grew up in Devon, uh, which is a very kind of maritime -y part of the UK. Uh, he'd actually spent some of his childhood overseas. His dad worked for the Royal Navy. 
Uh, so he, he'd spent part of his childhood in Sri Lanka and Gibraltar, always fascinated by ships and shipping and the sea. Um, and he went to sea as a sailor. Uh, he became what's called a, a master mariner. Uh, so qualified to captain commercial ships. He never actually sailed as a captain. He sailed as a first officer. Then he decided to work in ports. So he worked in Saudi Arabia, building the port of Jeddah. And he then um, ultimately got into the insurance game. And there is a, a big market for these uh, insurance investigators uh, who are typically former captains with a lot of maritime experience. There is at least one, more likely a few of them in every major port in the world and, and every minor port, frankly. Uh, so he really knew ships and shipping. Matthew, can you tell us on average, how many inspections he would do a year? Uh, probably 20 to 25, I would think. Uh, he and was not all guy. of them are, are related to murder and death or uh, uh, certainly not all of them are are tragic. I mean, some of them are insurance claims, right? Yes, of course. I mean, most of this would be totally routine. It's, you know, a ship runs into its pier, uh, cargo goes bad, that kind of thing, triggering an insurance claim. In the part of the world where David was, Yemen, the Gulf of Aden, uh, obviously piracy was a concern. Uh, particularly at this time, so he would have also he also did do a number of piracy cases, but but yes, most of it was routine. So Alan has a question here, which I think is right up our alley. How do people that do these inspections and others that are on the the vessels themselves, for instance, the merchant marines, how do they protect themselves? Are they bonded? You know, what kind of insurance do they have that they won't be hijacked? Well, uh, look, there, there's obviously a couple ways to protect yourself. One way is financial, which is insurance. Uh, and so every commercial ship, uh, and, and actually specifically every commercial voyage uh, is insured. Uh, generally, that insurance comes from Lloyd's of London. Uh, Lloyd's, as I mentioned earlier, is not an insurer. Uh, it is actually a physical location where the insurers we all know, you know AIG, Prudential, whatever, uh, come to divvy up risk. And the way this works is if you have a very large asset, you know, for example, an oil tanker carrying $100 million of oil, no one insurer wants to be on the hook for that. So the function of Lloyd's is to take that uh, quote unquote risk and slice and dice it into tiny little pieces, which are then absorbed by syndicates of many, many insurers. So actually one vessel might have 20, 30, 40 individual insurers so that if that vessel were to sink, uh, each of them only ends up paying a small part of the overall bill. So that's the biggest way uh, you protect yourself is you, you have insurance against things like piracy. Um, then there is physical protection. Uh, at the time our story begins, uh, the main way that vessels were being protected from piracy in this part of the world was uh, through uh, naval operations. There was a, a very large US-led uh, naval task force that had fanned out through this whole area of the world, trying to preempt and, and respond to piracy incidents. But even with, you know, I think it was 20 or 30 naval vessels that, uh, generally, that wasn't enough. Uh, this is a huge amount of water. There are huge numbers of commercial vessels going through it at any given time. Uh, piracy still happened all the time. What changed over the last you know, eight or nine years and has really brought, brought piracy down dramatically is uh, the addition of armed guards on vessels, which took a surprisingly long time for the industry to adopt. And there were a number of reasons why the industry didn't want to adopt it uh, above all costs, because of course this costs money. Uh, there were also legal considerations. You know, for example, if you arrive in some port in China and you have a bunch of kind of hairy mercenaries on board with weapons, uh, is that is that legal? Uh, is there was a lot that had to be worked out uh, before armed guards could be adopted. So that I, I think that I hope that answers on how how vessels are protected both financially and physically. Linda wants to know about the regulations of the maritime industry. How is it that it was lacking in regulation? 
Well, the biggest reason it's lacking in regulation, and this continues to this day, nothing has changed, uh, is that it's not, it isn't really located anywhere. Uh, from a legal perspective, the maritime industry might as well be on Mars. Uh, and the reason for that is that, um, so there are a few big shipping companies, which some people will have heard of. I think someone in the chat mentioned Mar Maersk MSC. Those, while they are very large, are the tiniest tip of the iceberg of the shipping industry. What they're in, what in fact dominates the shipping industry are hundreds and thousands of smaller family owned firms. Uh, many of them are owned by Greeks, uh, which is a whole other discussion we can get into. Um, as I mentioned, they will be typically the way a ship is owned is through a one ship company uh, set up in a tax haven in the Caribbean or the, or the Pacific. Uh, that company does not disclose its ownership uh, and it benefits from the legal protection of what are called secrecy jurisdictions, these, these small countries that uh, have very hospitable laws for the owners of assets. Uh, another way they avoid regulation is through something called flags of convenience. So we've all seen ships uh, that will say on the back, you know, you very rarely see a commercial ship that says London or New York as its home port. Uh, it's always Panama or Liberia or Majuro, which is the capital of the Marshall Islands. Um, the reason for that, and, and there's a very simple way to explain it. Uh, in the 30s, some very enterprising Americans and Panamanians, or the 20s rather, uh, figured out that if you flagged vessels as Panamanian rather than American, they could serve booze during prohibition. So that, that's kind of a funny example of, of the basic principle, which is the law on the vessel is the law of the so-called flag state. Uh, these flag states, the very popular flag states, Liberia, Liberia, Panama, the Marshall Islands are kind of the big three, um, have set up those laws to be extremely hospitable to ship owners. So just as you could serve alcohol, that also means you're following Liberian rules on uh, pay and working conditions, uh, Liberian environmental standards, and so on. And these countries, these registries, I should say, uh, have no incentive to do anything that would upset their ship owner clients. Um, the fun fact about the Liberian registry is it has nothing to do with Liberia. Uh, it's actually a private company based in Virginia, which pays a fee to the Liberian government for the use of the Liberian flag. Uh, that was another fact, which when I learned it, I was it just, yeah, basically blew the top of my skull off. So Alan wants to know what the current threat to the maritime industry is today. Well, there are a few threats. Um, look, piracy remains a concern. Uh, the Gulf of Aden is not as bad as it was. Uh, things have really quieted down there. Uh, you do hear a lot about piracy in West Africa, uh, the Gulf of Guinea, you know, the coast of Nigeria, places like that. Uh, there are also issues uh, very close to where I'm sitting here uh, in the Strait of Malacca, which is uh, kind of the next part of the journey that Berlante Virtuoso was on, uh, where you cross from the Indian Ocean into the South China Sea and the Pacific, which is a, a very a sort of choke point. Piracy occurs where there is ungoverned land, uh, which is slightly counterintuitive, but, but pirates need a shore base. The reason Somali piracy was such an issue was that Somalia was a pretty lawless failed state where pirates could operate with impunity. Uh, you have today uh, similar conditions in parts of the coast of Nigeria that encourages a lot of piracy. Um, and you know there are there are certainly parts of Indonesia that are that are lawless enough where pirates can can operate successfully. So those are kind of the big ones. Um, I, I wish I could say one of the threats to the maritime industry was, uh, regulation and, and you know firm application of law enforcement, but sadly that, that doesn't seem to be happening. Linda wants to know, does this lack of regulation extend to cruise ships? And aren't yes, many of those absolutely. Liberian registered? Yes, they operate on exactly the same principles. Uh, obviously they have to be a little more careful uh, given that they are so public facing uh, and, and what they do is more visible. Uh, but look, we found out or were reminded uh, during the pandemic when a lot of sailors on cruise ships got stuck and were treated really, really horribly, um, that these crews really have very few rights. 
uh, almost no rights at all. And, and partly that is because of these flag of convenience structures. So we have other questions about shipping, but let's get back to our story of Mr. Mockett. So he investigates this ship and finds issues with it on his inspection and then promptly becomes murdered. Um, and they rule it as part of a um, piracy, or excuse me, as part of the um, Arab Spring, right? It doesn't necessarily get to being a piracy issue right away. Well, there, we have to separate two things. Um, so the attack on the vessel, on the Brillante, was obviously a pirate attack, although it was not just a pirate attack. Uh, it was much more complicated than that. Uh, and, and it was actually the center of a gigantic fraud. Um, the murder of David Mockett separately was blamed at the time uh, on terrorism, Arab Spring, wrong place, wrong time, that sort of thing. Um, as it emerged through the investigation of this case, uh, notably by Richard and Michael, the two private investigators I mentioned, um, in fact, he, he had almost certainly been killed uh, because he was he had become an obstacle to this fraud, uh, to, to the fraud, this fraud centering on the Brillante Virtuoso and, and the, the apparent pirate attack that occurred. So fast forward the story for me. Um, when David gets murdered, does his family eventually get a, an award of any kind or an acknowledgement of any kind? No, uh, and, and I think the emotional heart of the story, I think, is, is David Mockett's wife, Cynthia, uh, who has been very bravely battling for the last decade, decade plus, to get uh, some kind of justice for what happened to her husband, some kind of, certainly uh, she would really like some compensation as well. Uh, none of that has ever come, uh, certainly not from the ship owner, not from the insurance industry, not from the insurance companies who employed her husband to do this work. Uh, she has received nothing. Is she still battling? Yes, very much. She goes, she sort of dutifully, uh, she goes down to Westminster in London with her member of parliament uh, periodically to uh, meet with various people in government who, you know, say the right things, but but nothing ever happens. Which has opened up a bazillion questions. <laughs> when you were writing this, did you ever feel like you were at, at risk during your research? Or did these two individuals who did the primary investigation, were they threatened? Uh, we've all, everyone who gets into this particular story, uh, is either threatened or is warned of risks to their safety. Um, there are some very, very nasty people involved. Uh, and the people who've gotten hurt, uh, that extends beyond David. Uh, and, and in fact, there's at least one whistleblower involved in this case who, who we describe later in the book, uh, who still lives under police protection in the UK uh, because he put himself in so much danger by coming forward to, to share what he knew. Um, that said, I never felt and Kit never felt that the risk was really to us. Uh, and that's true generally. You know, I am a six foot something white guy who works for a big global media organization. I have a public profile. Uh, someone trying to hurt me uh, would be taking a huge risk uh, in terms of how noticeable it would be. The risk is much greater to sources, uh, to, you know, some anonymous sailor some anonymous insurance executive who shares uh, with me or with the police uh, what they know, putting themselves in danger. They are at way more risk uh, than I would ever be. Um, you know, all that said, uh, there is a certain Southern European country uh, known for its uh, olive oil and, and beaches um, that I will not be visiting, you know, certainly anytime soon and, and maybe ever. Someone wants to know, why didn't Lloyd's of London do better upfront diligence before insuring this vessel and its cargo? That is an excellent question. Uh, so one of the other things I learned in researching this story that just, again, blew my mind was Lloyd's insurers, uh, maritime insurers generally, pay out 
dodgy, suspicious, fraudulent claims all the time, constantly. Uh, and this strikes me as very odd. Uh, you know, if you are a bar owner and your business is losing money and you and you start a fire to try and get the insurance money, uh, there's a very good chance you will not get that money, uh, that it will be investigated and the claim will be denied. But if you are a ship owner and you have a money losing vessel, which you sink uh, and then claim the insurance on, there is a very good chance that you will get that insurance paid out. Um, there are a few reasons for this. One is uh, these are big clients for the most part. And so in the insurance industry, you know, accusing your clients of fraud is, is not a good way to, to retain their business. Uh, these insurers make a great deal of money. So writing off uh, suspicious claims from time to time doesn't put a huge dent in it. Uh, something else that is a very practical issue and very important is the way this works is if, if Gwen, if you have an insurance, if, if I'm insuring your ship, your ship sinks, you issue, you file an insurance claim, and then I refuse to pay it, you sue me. So, and then we're in, then we end up in court and we end up in what are called the Admiralty Courts in London, which is where these uh, disputes are adjudicated. And there is a very, very high legal bar to proving fraud. Uh, in those courts. Uh, and that's been established by precedent over time. So for example, as an insurer to prove that, a, that an owner did something fraudulent, I have to prove that that insurer uh, was directly responsible for what occurred. So for example, just saying, just proving that the crew was responsible for the fraudulent destruction of a vessel, that doesn't cut it because actually you're insured against what's called baratry, which is uh, sort of malfeasance by the crew. You have to prove it was the owner. Uh, and that can take years of litigation, which costs a huge amount of money. Uh, and at that point, you know, you may as well just want to pay it out and move on. Are there specific ports um, that are a little shady? I mean, when you're on land, you know what neighborhoods to go into and what neighborhoods not to go into. Are there ports that are rather like that, that share sort of seedy problems? Look, there, yeah, there are certainly places in the world that are less regulated than others uh, when it comes to ports. Um, but actually, what I think is really shocking about shipping and what I learned in the reporting of this book is the shady stuff, you know, happens in very nice office buildings in London, uh, not necessarily in dusty ports uh, in, in Yemen or, or West Africa. You know, it's the 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 sketchiness goes right to the top in this case. Um, Jennifer wants to know how you became interested in this story. And do you follow all maritime hijacking stories? Uh, that's a very good question. No, I have nothing to do with shipping. I, I'm a sort of generalist investigative reporter. Uh, I, I tend to do, uh, I mean, everything I do or almost everything I do relates to crime and corruption in some way. Uh, but I have no pre-existing interest in shipping. And, and indeed, I've, I've largely moved on from shipping after this book. Um, the way this particular story came to me was uh, Kit and I worked together on a very complicated project that was published in 2016 uh, about uh, what happened when Goldman Sachs went into business with Muammar Gaddafi, uh, the Libyan dictator, uh, which, believe it or not, did not end well. Uh, so we did a story together that turned out really nicely. Um, and then Kit actually came across this case at a conference. Someone mentioned it briefly. Uh, he heard about it. He sort of perked up when he heard that, got interested in it, uh, went to a hearing, uh, in London at the high court because there had been some litigation relating to this case. And was he was totally fascinated, uh, but he also realized it was it was probably a two person job uh, because it was so complicated. So he came and asked if I wanted to work on it with him, uh, and so that became a uh, a Bloomberg story that ran in 2017, a kind of lo a long magazine article. And we then thought we were done, but we kept in touch with some of the key sources. We kept following the story as it developed, and a couple of years later, we realized there's a book here. So you deal with corruption and 
things that really are sort of beyond the common guy's control, don't you? Yeah, I look for, um, I, yeah, I look for stories about international crime and corruption. Uh, my favorite kinds of stories, and, and Dead in the Water is certainly one of these, are stories that connect, you know, developing the developing world and kind of remote uh, countries that the people don't often think about with events in places like New York and London. Uh, so that's that's kind of my my sweet spot when I can find those stories. In this particular story, is there a way that a person could have changed the outcome? Um, hmm. That's a very good question. Um, look, Richard and Michael, these two private investigators who are wonderful characters, they're ex uh, Metropolitan Police detectives from London. Uh, they're real kind of hard boiled uh, British coppers, you know, like we hope this will one day be on screen uh, and, and are working on that. And, you know, Michael Caine, if he's still alive, let's hope, uh, would be perfect, particularly to play Mick, um, Michael. Uh, that's sort of their vibe. Uh, they did a great deal to achieve a certain kind of justice. Um, but sadly, without the interest of law enforcement, uh, there was only so much they could do. And, and uh, law enforcement, particularly in the UK, uh, but also in the US, really failed on this case. And, and the perpetrators, uh, both of, of the fraud centered on the Berlante and of David Mockett's murder have never been charged with anything. Wow. These very large corruption stories are very disheartening, I think, to the average human being. And we read about them and learn about them and then kind of shake our heads and say, how can we make the world a better place? Is there something in general that you think that the average citizen can do? Uh, look, I think on something like this, uh, for something as large as shipping, as global as shipping, uh, it has to come from government uh, and, and probably specifically the US government. I, I don't think any other country would have the heft to really make anything happen. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sure it's not on their priority list, but but if you were to ask your congressman why the U.S. Uh, congressperson, why the U.S. does not require the disclosure of beneficial ownership of commercial vessels in U.S. ports, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I would guess a lot of members of Congress have no idea that the U.S. does not require that disclosure. Uh, you know, this is that is one change where if the U.S. government said tomorrow, any commercial vessel calling in an American port uh, needs to disclose its beneficial ownership, that would transform the shipping industry overnight. Uh, so actually the fixes here are not that complicated, uh, but you require political will uh, and you require concerted international action in, in many cases because this industry is so global. Speaking of movies, <laughs> Diane wants to know, um, she actually said, it sounds like a great story to be sold as a movie script. Is there any chance we might see this come out as a film in the future? Uh, more, uh, yes, basically, yes. Uh, not anything that is publicly disclosable yet, but we are uh, very optimistic this will be uh, probably on the small screen uh, fairly soon. I think this is a great time to mention, I'm not sure that Diane or anybody else is aware, this book was chosen by the economic, the Economist as the best book of 2022. And it, the Sunday Times of London considered it the book of the year. You got rave reviews for this book. Um, and in your next project, are you going to co-wrote with Kit again? I should probably clarify, we were, I, I wish The Economist said we were the best book of 2022. They said we were one of the best books, well, uh, as did The Sunday Times and, and the FT. Yes, it's still very high praise. Um, yeah, my next book, which I'm, I'm working on now, uh, is a solo project. Kit, Kit is going a different way uh, on, on something he's working on, which is very different. Um, my next book is extremely terrestrial. Uh, there are no boats involved. Uh, at all, as far as I can tell, 
Um, but but like Dead in the Water, it connects uh, events in a very far away remote place to, uh, in the case of my next book, literally Fifth Avenue in New York. Um, it, it's kind of one of those. Um, so that's that's what I look for, and and this one, but but the next book is rooted, whereas Dead in the Water starts in the Middle East. Uh, the next one is is all starting in Southeast Asia, where where I am now. Um, someone wants to know if the cartels take advantage of the shipping industry due to this lack of transparency and oversight, and is that common in other industries? Do they ever? Uh, there was just an amazing Bloomberg piece that I wish I wrote. Uh, I'm extremely jealous of the people who did. Uh, about uh, drug trafficking on uh, vessels operated by MSC, which is one of the world's largest shipping companies. Uh, and the case that this story focused on uh, involved an MSC container ship that was ultimately uh, busted by the DEA in the Port of Philadelphia with $1 billion of cocaine wow. hidden on board. Uh, and, and as the story revealed, uh, drug cartels have, have set up this very reliable supply chain uh, to sneak their cargo onto container vessels heading to the U.S. and Europe from South America. Um, so, yeah, the, this is how this is one big way that drugs get around the world. Alan wants to know how Singapore and Thailand share ties. Oh, uh, just being neighbors, uh, you know, Bangkok is a short flight from here. Uh, it's one of the, I think Thailand is, well, one of the largest economies in the region anyway. Uh, so we have a lot of, a lot of Thai connections here, although, although Singapore's closest connections in the region are, are to Malaysia, which is just next door. Um, do you see the same repeat characters in terms of businesses in these major corruptions across industries? I would say there are common themes. Uh, I think um, something that that connects a lot of the stories I look at is uh, people being happy to look the other way uh, or industries operating in a way that is suspicious or wrong, but because it's the way things are done, uh, no one has much of an incentive to stop it. You know, there, there's a there's an old line, I don't know who coined it, the scandal is what's legal. Uh, and actually, I, I find the scandal is what's commonplace. Wow. Uh, that when, you know, someone will say, when you say to someone, wait a minute, that sounds incredibly dodgy. They'll say, yeah, but that's how we've always done it. Uh, and, and there are lots of examples in industries like that. You know, a great one that comes to mind, um, some of the people on, on the call may remember the LIBOR scandal, uh, which was where essentially this, this interest rate that determines everything, all the kind of financial instruments in the world are priced relative to LIBOR, uh, was being set in a very uh, kind of scammy, self-serving way by a number of banks in London. Um, but that was just the way it was done. And, and when it was finally revealed what was going on, it was just lifting the lid on practices that for anyone in that industry were totally routine. Uh, so I think there's there's a lot of that around. The two lead investigators for this particular incident, how many hours, how many days, how many months do you think they devoted in their life to uncovering it? Uh, I can tell you they, they spent seven years on this case. Uh, not quite full time, but pretty much full time. Do most cases that you look at, do most the things that you're looking at in terms of corruption take that much time to come to light? Uh, it depends. You know, so the, the one of the central characters of my next book, um, similarly, is someone who has devoted his life, basically, to, to unraveling something. Um, you know, Richard and Michael in, in Dead in the Water were getting paid. I mean, they were, they were well compensated by their clients who were the insurance companies. Um, so this was, this was their career, this was their job. Uh, but yeah, complex international fraud is incredibly difficult to investigate, you know, even as a journalist. And, it, and if you're trying to do things in a way that is legally usable, uh, that can survive a London court, uh, that's an incredible amount of work. Uh, so yeah, the, the investigating this kind of wrongdoing depends on people who are willing to, to devote very large amounts of time. 
Do you think because of the fact that there are wars in the world currently, specifically the Ukraine, that it's changed the landscape of abuse and crime? Ukraine's really interesting. I mean, for many, there are many reasons why the Ukraine war is, is interesting, obviously. Um, there is, a, specifically, there's a shipping reason, which I find really uh, could, could make a difference. Um, so one of the things that has happened in the various sanctions packages on Russia is the European Union and the UK governments have said, we don't want, uh, we don't want companies in our countries insuring Russian vessels. You know, we don't want uh, we don't want to provide insurance for Russia to export its oil, for example. Um, so that's interesting because that implies that insurers need to know who they're insuring, sure. uh, which they don't. Uh, so you know, we're going to see this this area of law is still developing, um, but I think we could at least in some cases see a kind of obligation imposed on insurers to know perhaps not the actual identity in terms of a name of who owns a vessel, but you know, certainly know certain things about them. Uh, and that could open the door a crack to more accountability. So that's an interesting offshoot of the Ukraine war that I've been paying a lot of attention to. What about the whole issue of global warming? Has that impacted corruption in, in, in ways? Uh, well, I'm sure there are, you I mean, know, in, internationally. Yeah, I'm sure there are, and, and others have documented, you know, some of the scams and scandals that have occurred uh, in green energy. I, I mean, I think in any, at any time when there's kind of a gold rush going on, uh, as there is around a lot of green technologies now, uh, there are going to be bad actors attracted to that. Um, so yeah, I think that's a very fertile area. Uh, it's a tough one for a lot of journalists because, you know, of course, we all want green energy to succeed, uh, but that doesn't mean there aren't uh, serious abuses occurring in, in some cases in that industry as, as in every other. I said in the introduction that you have been in at least 25 countries in the world. Did this story physically cause you to go investigate in Yemen or, in the Middle East? Uh, actually, no. Um, Kit and I, this was largely a pandemic project. Uh, so we did this mostly from our desks. Uh, I've never been to Yemen. I've certainly been to Greece. Uh, the um, Going to Yemen would also be very, very challenging, uh, given what's happened in that country over the last 10 years. Sure. Uh, but this is one that Kit and I both did yeah, pretty much uh, from Singapore in my case and, and London in his case. We did a bit of travel, but but not much. I know that your next story is not based in the maritime, but do you see other big future maritime issues coming to light in terms of corruption? Oh, God, yes. Yeah, uh, there's so much. Um, you know, one that has gotten a little bit of coverage, not enough, is uh, something called sea slavery. Uh, there are, particularly in Asia, a lot of examples of people who have been you know, trafficked or, or in the worst cases, sort of kidnapped to work on things like fishing trawlers. Um, the Associated Press did a big investigation uh, a while ago about the shrimp industry, which is astonishing. Um, yeah, it's a very rich, there, there's a very, very rich vein of stories in, in the maritime world for, for investigative journalism to go after. What do you want the average reader to know about this story, other than just the uh, the story itself? Um, I think, you know, one thing I hope the book does is cause readers to think a little bit about how stuff gets to them. Uh, you know, where this all comes from, who gets it to them. You know, we haven't talked about the crews on these vessels who are uh, you know, without whom the entire world would grind to a halt, but who are, you know, paid very little, treated very badly, have no rights, are, excuse me, are overwhelmingly from very poor countries uh, like the Philippines, India, Indonesia, um, and really are, are kind of the backs on which the entire global economy is built. Uh, so look, I think if this book causes people to think a little more to wonder a little bit, to ask questions about 
how things get to them, how international, you know, we say supply chains, which is this very bloodless term. Um, supply chains are people. Uh, and, and those are people who, you know, have had a lot of harm done to them in many cases over the years. You had a wonderful line in the introduction of your book about how the shipping industry's success has curiously led it to become invisible. And we live here in Northeast Ohio, very close to a, I would say a secondary port of Cleveland, Ohio. And we see the big ore carriers come in and go out of the port every day. It's hard to conceptualize that they're invisible. And yet I don't think people know about people that survey um, vessels for insurance or the first mates or the engineers. So I think you raise a very strong point about um, seeing the industry for the fact that it's they're humans behind the word supply chain. And um, so thank you for bringing it to our attention as well. Um, we wish you well in your future endeavors, and we hope we'll see this on the big screen sometime soon. I would encourage everyone to read this book. I would specifically tell you, go to the Learned Owl or go to your library and please um, pick up Dead in the Water and read it because it really was a fascinating read for me. And I think that you will enjoy it as well. I hope that you're close to publishing a new book. After having read this one, I want to read your next one in the worst way, and I'm kind of curious about it. So we look forward to perhaps having you back again. Um, if you should ever be in Northeast Ohio or in the vicinity of the Great Lakes, hopefully not for a corruption story, but we would love to have you. <laughs> um, and I hope that you find a story that has a, a nice ending sometime too. I, I kind of feel for Cynthia um, mock it and hope that she finds justice somehow in the world for the loss of her spouse. Um, I hope things are good in, in Singapore for you. And wait a minute. Paul wants to say great session, really engaging, informative. He looks forward to reading the book. So thank you. And thank you for getting up at an unusual hour in Singapore for us and telling this very important story. Um, Alan says, please have the author return. And he means in person, by the way. <laughs> uh, I would be delighted to. Yeah, if I'm ever if I'm ever in the neighborhood, uh, I will I will certainly take you up on that. Thank you so much, Gwen. I really appreciate your thank kind you. words. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you. You all have a good night. And please take a chance and look at our future author talks. We hope that you'll join us. Thank you, Matthew. Take care. Bye -bye. Go out and buy the book, everybody. Bye-bye.